listening to the Sermon Audio Podcast from Redeemer Lutheran Church and Pastor Paul Pett. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Hallelujah! you know we do that for seven weeks, right? Because we are in the season of Easter. And Easter is what makes Christianity different than all other religions. In no other religion did their God die and rise again for them. So the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For those of you who may not know, I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in the parsonage. A friend of mine who's also a pastor's kid calls us T.O.'s. Theologians' offspring, as opposed to PKs. Before I had a desk of my own, my father would permit me to use the desk in his office to do my homework. And right above his desk was the picture, the popular picture, of Jesus on the way to Emmaus with the two disciples on either side of Jesus. One day, Toward the end of Christmas vacation, I was supposed to be doing my homework. And my dad, as he often would do, would open the door and said, Son, is your homework done? And he caught me looking, staring, meditating on that picture that was above his desk. Because my homework was the furthest thing from my mind. I was sad. Very sad. Jean Gettler was the conductor of our cherub choir at church, and I sang in the cherub choir. And his wife, Billy, was taken ill right before Thanksgiving, and she was called home to heaven at just 30 years old, plus a little bit. And her funeral was on New Year's Day. I was sad. Very sad. And as my dad looked at me, he saw me, my eyes were fixed on that picture of Jesus with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he asked, do you know the story behind the painting? So I told him what I remembered about the two disciples not realizing that the stranger was Jesus and how they recognized him when they broke the bread and he vanished. And then my dad asked me a question. So what's the point? All of a sudden, I didn't understand. I got all the facts right. But that wasn't the point. Obviously, it wasn't. And so I asked, so I asked him, will you please tell me, what's the point of the Emmaus event? And the point is not just the facts. The point is in the significance of the abiding presence. The abiding presence of Christ. The abiding presence in the Holy Scripture. The abiding presence in the sacraments of Holy Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And his abiding presence as he seeks to help us in the strategy of our life. What kept the disciples from recognizing Jesus is that they were sad. Yes, their eyes were restrained or held back by the Lord, so they did not know him. But it was also that grief that hit them like a freight train. Anybody ever been there besides me? No? Let's see the hands. Who's been there? And you don't know how to go on. They were numb with sadness. For you, any sadness you may have experienced in your life may or may not have been due to the death of a loved one. Sadness in your life may be the result of poor decisions you've made or a situation you cannot resolve or a conflict with someone else. The point is, that the sadness is the result of sin. What is sin? Do you remember that? 
You confess them. You were forgiven your sins. A sin is anything we do, think, or say that is against God's holy will. It was the abiding presence of our Lord that helped the disciples first to work through what they had experienced and second, how they had thought about things. Jesus said to them, what kind of conversation is that, is that, this, that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? To which one of the disciples said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and haven't heard and known the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus gives, him, gives them an opportunity to tell them. Because he says, What things? <coughs> Obviously, he didn't look at his hands. Jesus gave them an opportunity to witness, to explain the events as they perceived them. In their own words, they expressed a misconception of what Messiah was sent to do. We were hoping that it was he, Jesus, who was going to redeem Israel. Their idea of being free from... Who was in charge at that time? Rome. The misunderstanding was the disciples' concept of the redemption of Israel. That's why beginning at Moses and all the prophets, did you get that? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We call it the Pentateuch. And the prophets, what did they write? The rest of the Old Testament. So all of the scripture, Jesus is telling them all the things concerning himself. For example, did you know Jesus' words from the cross is in Psalm 22? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm sure that's one he picked. Because Israel was not to be redeemed from the political power of Rome. They were redeemed from something much greater, much more oppressive, much more crushing. They were redeemed, brought back, bought back. That's what redeem means. Did you know that? Redeemer, Lutheran Church, redeem. You're bought back from all the causes of sadness, all the causes of sin. Now, there are over 300 prophecies about Messiah to be found in the Old Testament. Whether Jesus has used all of them is not the point. The point is the abiding presence of Jesus as Messiah, the Christ of God, was made evident to these two disciples in a way they had never understood before, to help them in their sadness. It was after the encounter with Jesus that the disciples remarked, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? For it is true that the Christ had to suffer these things in order to enter his glory. The Christ came to this earth to take upon himself all the sin of mankind. But before he did that, he lived perfectly the life that's expected of you and me and all, all people. And he gave you that perfection when he called you to saving faith. Then he took all of your sins with him to the cross and washed them all away in his precious blood. Three days later, he rose from the dead, guaranteeing that one day you too will rise from the sleep of death. And he ascended into heaven 40 days after that and promises you and me and all who believe in his name that he will be back to take you and all who believe to him forever in heaven. That's the point. Abide in his presence in heaven forever. <clears throat> the point for me as a boy sitting at my father's desk was that what happened to the disciples on the road to Emmaus needed to happen to me. It needs to happen to you personally. Not just once, 
but over and over again throughout our lives. A continuous action, if you will, to have my heart continually warmed, to have your heart continually warmed in the abiding presence of his holy word and his blessed sacraments. It was the comfort of that word that helped me deal with my particular sadness and particular sadnesses that I've had since. I know that I will see Mrs. Gettler again in heaven, and I will see again all those who I love, who have departed in the faith, who now are with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven. And do you know if you've lost a loved one in the faith, when you come to the table, guess who's at the table with you? Your loved one. You can't see them in the in the preface to Holy Communion. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. And guess who's singing with you? Your loved ones. It was a comfort to know that by the abiding presence of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I will live with him forever in heaven. I will live with you again forever in heaven and overcome whatever makes us sad in this life. The presence of the Lord abides with us whenever we hear or read the scriptures, but his abiding presence is also in the sacraments, the sacrament of holy baptism, and the sacrament of the altar. In retrospect, how delighted the disciples must have been when they constrained Jesus in saying, abide with us for it is evening and the day is far spent, and he did it. He went in with them. And St. Luke records, Now it came to pass he sat, as he sat at table with them that he took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to them. Had the disciples seen Jesus do this before? Just a few days before at Passover, and they had seen him do it at the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. The disciples had seen the Lord do it several times. However, the last time the disciples saw the Lord take the bread, bless it, and break it, and give it to them was at the meal where he said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Take and drink, this is my blood shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. It was at the moment when the Lord offered them this bread, that their eyes were open and they knew him. They were not celebrating the sacrament here, but it was at that moment of the breaking of the bread when the Spirit caused the disciples to be aware of who it was at the table with them. You and I are also to remember, to remember our baptism daily. How do you do that? You do wash your face every morning, right? You can remember as, the, as you wash the grime off your face that the Lord has washed the grime of sin away from you in your baptism. When, his abiding, when you abide in his presence, we participate with Christ in his death and his resurrection. We are also to remember the price he paid for our redemption. What did Peter write? Not with gold or silver, but with his Holy, precious blood, when we celebrate that at the, at the meal at the altar. For in that very meal, we receive his abiding, abiding presence for the strengthening of our faith until that day when he takes us home to be with him forever in heaven. And that's the point. To be the, in the abiding presence in the scriptures, in the sacrament, and in the strategy which we live our lives. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I went over to Wisconsin Rapids. I served my first in the first parish, was at Emmanuel. And my brother pastor at St. Luke's was Tim Wenger. Now, I just, I'm in remission right now. I'm su suffering from multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the blood. And Tim also had that same malady. And the Lord chose to take Tim to himself in heaven. 
And as we were sit, as we were standing there, all the pastors in their robes, <coughs> one pastor said to me, I heard you have the same thing Tim had. I said, yeah, I do. And he said, but you're still alive. I said, yes, I am. He says, and he said, that's better than the alternate. I says, that's a lie. How do you know? You've never been to heaven. You might say, if I live, I live to the Lord. If I die, I die to the Lord. So whether I live or I die, I belong to the Lord because I am abiding in his presence. And God may, may God make that be your mantra this next week. Whether I live, I live to the Lord. Whether I die, I die to the Lord. So whether I live or I die, I am the Lord's. Abiding in his presence will make a huge difference in how we respond to each other how we speak and act toward one another, and how we seek to minister to each other in whatever sadness may be happening in our life. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in the love of Christ until the day you see him face to face in heaven. Amen. Thanks for listening. At Redeemer Lutheran Church, our mission is to share with all people the good news of Jesus Christ, teaching faith and love. Learn more about our ministry at RedeemerLutheranGB.com.